Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the ninth episode of our webcast series, Affluence to Wealth. My name is Sarman. I will be your co-host for today. With me, I've got Ara and we've got Andrew, our special guest. How's it going, guys? It's going great. How are you, Sarman? Not bad. Not bad. I wish, so originally we had planned to be outside, outdoors, nice sunny day, but uh, someone was doing some construction, so uh, we decided to move in. And they just happened to stop. But yeah, they did happen to just stop. But, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, we're very excited for today. The topic is ensuring success when either buying or selling a business under $5 million. And we're very happy to have our guest because Andrew and his team at m and Evolution do just that. They advise their clients on either purchasing or selling businesses under $20 million. And fun fact... Andrew was the advisor on our most recent deal that we closed in the pet service industry. So we know Andrew quite a uh, quite well now. And it was a, it was a very uh, easy transaction. It closed in very little time, and it was a, a pleasure working with him. Yeah, with with the help of uh, managing partner Phil King, and and with Andrew, things were smooth sailing. So um, so yeah, thanks again for being here with us. We'll just jump right in, and uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and. M&A Evolution and your uh, experience there. Well, before we start, I have to say that it was also enjoyable working with you guys, but I never <laughs> thought it would start my uh, TV and media career. <laughs> 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 so a little bit about my background. Um, I was a multiple business owner a number of years ago and went to uh, you know consider exit and sell my businesses and saw firsthand the benefit of what an advisor and M&A can provide as far as uh, value to a client who's doing that for the first time. Okay. And just by happenstance, uh, I happened to be offered a position at the firm that sold the businesses for me. And I didn't even know what an M&A advisor or business broker was at the time. And uh, once I saw what it was about and how much you can help clients, I thought this is what I want to do. Right. So dove in, you know, both feet first. Uh, and next thing you know, a number of years later, we founded M&A Evolution where we're helping clients just like I was helped a number of years ago. Right. Yeah. As, as a president and co-founder and the managing partner, Phil, as we mentioned, both uh, great, very easy to work with team. Uh, and so what, why, why did you want to target small businesses? Well, I mean, a number of things. I think first and foremost is when you look at business owners, just because they have a big and successful business doesn't mean they've gone through the exit procedure right. before. Uh, so number one is providing value. Right? You're, you're helping people that are genuinely making the biggest decision of their life a lot of time. And you, you'll hear that selling a home is the biggest transaction you'll ever go yeah. through, but that's really not the case a lot of the time. <laughs> it's, it's the business. Uh, you know, and the second thing is small businesses are the backbone of the economy, right? So by selling businesses rather than having owners shut them down or wrap up shop, you're helping perpetuate job creation and maintenance of economy, right? So it's, and it's it a very good thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. That, that's part of our, our marketing as well. And it's true. We, we've saved one business from closing down. We bought the assets. Yeah. And, uh, and we're glad you're doing this because we're on the, obviously the buy side. Mm -hmm. And we do, uh, most of our deals have been without brokers, but there's always been an advisor with the seller. Because, you know, you do need that professional to guide them through because it's the first time, like you said, yeah. they've done this. And it's much easier for us as well when there's someone that has done this before to help them through. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. great. I mean, the vicarious joy you feel by helping somebody do that, you get just as jazzed up as they do when you actually succeed in making that yeah. transaction happen. Yeah. No, a lot of these business owners are very good at what they do, whether they're manufacturing steel, windows, whatever it might be but they do need a helping hand when it's time to sell the business, right? Or the finances, the you know, institutionalizing, professionalizing, a lot of the stuff that they haven't focused on. They've cre focused on creating the best product, but not to, you know, to bring it to market. So, so yeah. Correct. And the exit is sometimes their retirement as well, because it is usually tax-free if they, they haven't used up their $1 million lifetime capital gains exemption. So, yeah. so it's usually a, yeah. a great exit. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what trends are you seeing in the market now? You know, there's a lot of going, there's a lot going on. Interest rates are rising. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of baby boomers are looking to retire. What trends are you seeing in the market? Well, you touched on two of the biggest <laughs> ones there. I think the first one that everybody's aware of is, you know, the interest rate and how it's gone up significantly from the pre and, you know, during the COVID era. Uh, depression in, in the valuation is what we're seeing a little bit. Like, okay. you know, you're seeing valuations come down slightly. But the interesting thing when you're looking at M&A is that the actual multiple of 
whether it's EBITDA, you know, discretionary earnings, whatever metric you're looking to uh, value against, that number doesn't really change. The mm -hmm. dollar value might fluctuate, but the actual multiple is remaining relatively stable. Right. And this is based on you know, industry data from three decades plus that we have access to. And we're seeing that a lot of those are being maintained. Second thing is the implementation of technology, whether it's AI or just facilitating automation as much as possible, is allowing owners to run a lot more lean. Right. So you see the foray into entrepreneurship being you know, quite popular these days, especially with the younger generation. We're seeing a lot of people that are entering business, whether it's as a side gig or as a main gig, right. because they have the ability to scale relatively quickly for a minimal capital investment, right. depending on the industry. And you know, the third thing is retire, uh, retirement. Like a lot of these baby boomers, what we call the silver tsunami, this is kind of in the midst the of the silver, silver tsunami. Silver tsunami. Where yeah. is, where, I've heard you say this. I'm actually <laughs> curious to know what's the origin of that. I don't know. I heard it somewhere and I picked it up and I thought that's very descriptive <laughs> of what we're looking at. Silver hair or whatever. <laughs> Pretty much, right? Yeah. Yeah. So all of these baby boomers are retiring and either they have no succession with family or no succession period. So there's a flood of businesses coming on the market that have been successful for a number of years and they might be deemed unsexy. You know, it could, right. be, could be manufacturing widgets, could be, you know, selling windows and doors, something like that. But all of these are perpetually needed businesses that are eminently successful, right? So right. there's over the next five to seven years, quite a number of opportunities out there to purchase. Yeah. Right. And, and that's our target as well. I was so. going to say number two, the second point is there's more people looking to take ownership and we're here to support them, right? Yeah. So, so we, our view is to grow the, the platform. So we're, we're closed, uh, we're on our sixth transaction now, but we're going to stop managing those ourselves. So we're going to promote others to bring us deals and take over the management which of, of the silver tsunami yeah. owners. Well, consolidation is one of them, right? And, you know, PE Gate identified very well uh, a mature industry that was very fractured in the deal that we did. And once you get to that stage of uh, development in a market, you start to see a lot of strategic opportunities gather together as are called it a platform. And they scoop up small businesses and continue to build their portfolio right. in a very limited silo, right? Right. And we're seeing that in the dentist industry and several others. Um, yep. So are, would you say owners are more willing to sell in this environment? Or you know, are you seeing an influx of businesses coming to market? Or given the environment, they're not? Well, with the retirement thing that we just mentioned, there's kind of just that natural influx. Um, Post-COVID fatigue is a big one as well. Right. It, was, it was very strenuous for a lot of owners to maintain and keep their business afloat during COVID, especially depending on the industry. If you were in hospitality, health and wellness, where you were dealing with closures and reopenings on a very unexpected basis, a lot of the owners are saying, you know what, I'm back to kind of stable revenue. I want to just exit and try right. something else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And on the buy side, there are a lot of opportunities to buy as well and the willingness to participate in entrepreneurship, like we touched on a little bit before, that's also rampant, right? So yes, to both questions, there's a lot yeah. of opportunity to buy and sell. Yeah. <laughs> and we're seeing a lot of that, right? Yeah. And, and for us, what we're seeing is the timing is they don't care what's happening in the market. If they're going to retire in one year, they're going to retire in one year. And what we advise people and others, uh, other guests have advised, start now, start planning now. We know there's some business owners on this webcast. So you have to start planning the process. Maybe, um, And that's something that you guys help with uh, in terms of planning, uh, preparing for the exit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of things that an owner can and should do before exiting. Uh, you know, number one is financial preparation. And sometimes it's two or more years out of the exit consideration. So when we meet with a client, it's not, hey, I want to sell my business. And then the next day you're on the market. Sometimes it's years, months yeah. uh, before that decision is actually taking place. So making sure that you shift your perspective from tax mitigation at a corporate level to profitability so that when you're marketing the business to, to buyers, they see that, hey, this business is making money and I don't need to go dig through the financials too deeply to justify that. Right. Can, can you explain that a bit? That's I was really just interesting. That's a yeah. good one. So, uh, sorry. From, but, from entire, yeah. To profitability, I think that's a big... Because if you have an owner-operator, you know what's coming in, what's coming out, and you are the main, you know, the one taking home the money, but you want to... Or I want to explain on your behalf. Yeah. yeah, you want to make it more appealing to a potential purchaser based on the profitability of the business. Yeah, well, we all know that uh, Mr. Trudeau has his hands in the pockets of many business owners. 
right? So the strategy from a tax mitigation perspective is for corporate um, profit to be as low as possible right. so that there's less, less taxation on the business, right? But what that does is when you market the business, the buyer's first question is, well, how does this business make money? Right. right? And there could be a number of non-essential expenses going through the business that we end up extricating and doing what we call normalizations to demonstrate the true earning power of a business to a buyer. When you're starting to consider exit for at least the two years before that decision, you want to have a nice clean trend of profitability where everything is justifiable and you're not putting you know repairs on the cottage or six family cars and cell phone plans through the business, which every small business owner does. Right. But and, yeah, I, I totally agree. From a buyer's perspective, when we see those normalizations, we don't believe them. It reduce it raises risk to us. Yeah. So all of a sudden we're spending time and it may actually cause the deal to fall through. So totally agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Keep it as a separate business. Don't put your cottage expenses through it. Uh, and keep it clean because that's what we're looking for in business investing. And an important thing to mention on that note is when you're going for funding, banks will only accept a certain level of normalization, right? Like they won't go down to the granular level that a buyer will. Right. Uh, so if you have too many things to justify in there, your funding may not be approved. It might be an issue to actually move through that stage with a bank or whether it's a private equity firm or whoever is doing right. that deal, right? Makes sense. So what would you say is the most difficult part of your job working with small businesses. I know we've had our fun with uh, politics coming. I mean, there's always politics, but someone not wanting to sell. Uh, or their partner. Based on, based on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Based, <laughs> yeah, anyway. based, yeah. So what, what would you say is, uh, what makes it difficult to work with a small business? I don't know if difficult is the right word. I think maybe. Challenging. It's cha yeah. It's, sure. It, there's certain challenges that we see. And I think the first one is, you know, setting expectations. Okay. Right? You want to help whoever you're, whether it's the buy side or the sell side, uh -huh. understand very detailed what they're going to go through, right? How, and more importantly, how they're going to feel at each stage of the deal. Right? This isn't a week-long engagement. These are months and years that sometimes it takes to finalize. And you're going to go through emotional fluctuations, especially because it's the first time a lot of these people are doing this, right? right. Especially on the sell side. Um, the second thing is probably you know, keeping it fun, right? You want to maintain an amicable relationship between all parties and make sure that when the deal actually closes and we've extricated ourselves from the deal, there's a relationship that's founded on trust and that, you know, goodwill, et cetera. So I think exactly why you're here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? it's because we've had a very good experience so far. Uh, we closed, uh, it's going to be two and a half months and the transition uh, was really good. Um, and so, so far it's been a great experience and that's really important. And because we see some, uh, some sellers, the expectations really high of the owners. Yeah. In terms of valuation, there, there is a range of if it's a multiple that small businesses can can attract, and when you're pushing that, it, you know it just doesn't make it feasible for us. So, yeah. so how, how do you deal with that valuation question? Well, it, on the second, you know, or third thing, I can't remember how many I enumerated before that, but education is a big component, right? Just because a seller has invested X dollars into their business, for example, doesn't mean they're going to get that dollar value out. So educating them not only on the process, but on how valuation works, how buyers look at businesses, right? That educational component is one of the largest aspects of what we do. And when you say small business, it could be $30 million on the grand scheme of things. Right. That's still a small business. Right. Uh, there still might be a significant number of things that you need to educate that client on and help them understand that, hey, you might only get X for this. And it might be more than they think, right? But they truly don't know what they don't know. And that's a big thing for us as well. Interesting. Yeah, that's what makes it easier for us uh, to close the deal with, yeah. with uh, advisor and broker. Well, and with you guys, qualifying was, was not an issue, right? Because you were very clear on your expectations, what you wanted, your financial positioning. So when we, and that's a big word in our industry, qualifying, you want to qualify the buyer, qualify the seller, and see truly what they're, they're all about, both right. from a skill set, personality, financial strength. And there's a number of skill, you know, a number of other things you can you can add to that list, but qualifying that opportunity heavily up front is going to make the process infinitely easier and smoother down the line. Right. So that actually kind of pivots to our, our next question, I'd say is it was easy to work with you. And is would you say that's part like what are some of your core values uh, of MA evolution? Is is being um, you know easy to work with? One of them is what what would you say is your focus when dealing with uh, with clients, both either on the buy or sell side. 
Well, I think first and foremost, a client is putting so much trust in us that ethical uh, client first approach is the way we, you know, we, we look at it. We're not going to put our own interests ahead of the client. Right. And oftentimes that means saying no in many instances. Right. Right. So letting them know that, hey, this might sound like a good opportunity, a good deal, but there might be something better. You, have you, have you said no to, to some per potential purchasers? Of course. Yeah. Oh, wow. I think we say no we, more than we say yes. In That's true. Right? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Because I will say that, I mean, this is something we've noticed is legacy is a big part of these small business owners. It's, it's not like you're selling, you know, Dre's by Beats, right, um, to, to Apple. It's, these are businesses that an entrepreneur has started and has fed their family for 20, 30 years. And there's a, maybe a family name on it, multiple generations, and there is a legacy aspect of it. And sometimes purchasers are looking to just absorb the business and implement it into their current business. For us, we, we one of our focuses is to come out the gates and say, you know, we're not looking at, to, 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 to change the name and, and, and change the operations, we're looking to improve and build up off of it. So I think it is interesting in the smaller business space where legacy is a big part of it. So yeah. qualifying. Yeah. For and especially some businesses we've seen, it's the founder has been passed away, it's the right. family, and they, they really want to maintain that legacy. Mm -hmm. And there's brand value in that. So we don't really see the need to, to, to rebrand necessarily. We always do a re brand refresh and so on. Yeah. yeah. So so this was actually our first deal that we've used an advisor. The other five were self-found. Um, we enjoyed it. What would you say are benefits that you bring to a, a potential buyer when it comes to closing and trying to see? So we did, we've done five deals with that one. We've done one with we see the value, but what would you say for, for everyone else, you know, the benefits you bring to a buyer? To a buyer? Yeah. Well, I mean, a number of things. We bring industry knowledge, very specific industry knowledge about what the expected multiples can be in this particular market that you guys might be looking at. Right. Uh, and one thing that we enjoyed with PE Gate was that you're very much of the collaboration mentality. So, you know, to your last question, what are some of the things that uh, we bring? It's in any sort of client representation environment. You can easily have a very adversarial dynamic, right? But when it comes to collaboration and truly understanding what the other side is looking for and meeting in the middle, so to right. speak, that's one of the things that I'm not sure how other advisors yeah. would do it. And but with us, that's a, a prime consideration for both advisor. buyers and sellers to truly understand what are their end goals and what are their wants, and how can we reverse engineer it using our skill set of you know putting together a deal stack, putting together terms and conditions, yeah. bringing the right advisors to the table to help you with that. How can we best achieve that for both parties? Because ultimately, if one side agrees and the other side doesn't agree, we probably won't have a deal as much as we want to. Yeah. Right? Like we're, we're truly con consultants. We're not salespeople. We're not trying to convince anybody to do anything. Right. We're trying to help to the best of our ability. Yeah, and yeah. fill in those knowledge gaps wherever they might be. Right. And what about, oh, sorry. I was going to yeah, say, no, I, I gonna say for, for us, and, and we do take a neutral, fair approach, you're right, and mainly because we can't afford not to. <laughs> right because it costs a lot of money it, you go down the path and then if you're st stuck on negotiating terms that are never going to be at looked at what's the point you're just going to incur legal costs and increase the risk of the deal falling through so so we take a very fair approach to manage legal fees yeah deals this size we're looking at you can't afford to to, to pay high legal fees yeah and that's how uh, i think we've been somewhat uh, not somewhat but successful at, at at closing deals in a, on a timely basis. So that's one thing I, I, I would give you guys a compliment. You guys were good at that legal process was well managed and you guys saw the commercial aspects of the legal negotiations. I appreciate not, that. Not, and you managed you know, the process well. Well, yeah. it comes back to that buzzword of qualifying, right? Right. And Ara and Sarman and I had a number of discussions before taking any sort of serious steps into putting together binding agreements, et cetera, to make sure that whatever their expectation was, was also going to meet the expectation of the seller. And once we did have those discussions, it's not anything that's going to catch anyone off, you know, off guard or by right. surprise because we've already covered those bases. Right. And what about on the, uh, for the seller? What potential benefits do you offer to the seller? Uh, like we said, you know, you help professionalize. You need to start earlier on. Uh, what are some of the value adds you'd say you'd add uh, or you bring to a person looking to sell their business? Well, understanding the process, number one, right? Like we talked about a little bit earlier, some of these sellers have done this, you know, they've run their business for three, four decades, but they've never actually considered an exit. So 
clearly laying out a path of here's what we're going to go through, here's the expected timeline, and here's how you're going to feel during that process. That's the number one thing. Uh, it's, like, it's all very similar from buyer to sellers, actually, right. right? Industry data, bringing the right advisors to the table. Whether we're doing a buy or a sell side mandate, a lot of those uh, value adds that we bring to the table are, are quite similar. It's just a different fiduciary responsibility from one to the other, but you're still negotiating terms. You're still putting together deal stacks, putting together funding if that's required. Right. And even though we represent one side exclusively, usually, we still assist with the other side's uh, facilitation of whatever they might need to actually get the deal done. Right. So uh, deals that are under, say, $2 million transaction value, the, at the time the client signs is, is re- and is ready to put into market, how long does it usually take for it? I mean, we, we say eight to 12 months, but there's so many moving parts and a lot of that could be the bank. A lot of that could be uh, if it's with a franchise, for example, what are the franchise's needs. So going back to that word again, qualifying, upfront understanding what those third parties might need in order for them to make a quick yes or no decision comes back onto the conversations that we have with people up front. And that really helps speed things along in that regard, right? But there's so many moving parts that it's hard to define. I mean, I've had deals take two or three years for various reasons. And I've had deals, you know, like the one we did, it took a number of months, right? So the preparatory uh, steps that each party is taking beforehand is going to contribute to that uh, speed of closing a deal and the, the efficiency with which it's done, you know? Interesting. Yeah. And what we say to business owners that have started the process um, is don't change your business model, right? Don't make decisions based on, oh, you're going to exit, therefore you need to do these things. So continue operating the business as you would. And because you never know how long that transaction is going to take. Yeah. No, that's a good point. It segues into a number of things that we talked about in that, like, what are the true value adds of the business? What do they do well? And is that going to be maintained moving forward so that you maybe mitigate your risk as a, a new owner? Right? right. Speaking of risks, how would you think we're talking about overcoming key risks, right? What are some of the key risks that you see that you could name either from the buyer's or seller's side when they don't come ready or when you don't qualify? Well, understanding it's not so much what's in the agreement that's going to come back to bite you. It's what's not in the agreement. Right. right. So understanding <laughs> <laughs> understanding the terms and conditions that you need to cover in order to protect both sides and make sure that should something um, need to be done regarding the agreement, that you can come back to the thing you've papered and say, hey, look, we talked about this here. We've already agreed to it. Let's move forward. Um, I mean, there are, so, yeah, go ahead. Are you seeing more asset purchases? Because uh, buyers want to purchase assets as a risk or is it a trend towards share purchase? Generally speaking in our firm, we opt for the share purchase. You mentioned capital gains exemption earlier. That's a big factor. Yeah. Right. So we try to, as much as possible, take that approach to benefit the seller, but it also benefits the buyer because when you sell a business based on the assets, there's usually a pretty heavy tax burden on the seller and that may affect the selling price, right? For sure. It It might inflate the selling price to make sure that the seller comes out whole in the end with a certain number of consideration. So we've always taken the share purchase approach. Right. If it's not possible, we will do an asset purchase, but uh, generally speaking, the share purchase is the approach that we like to take. It is. I think it's a win-win. I think if, if you're willing to do proper due diligence, which was on our last episode, uh, we don't see the, the, the reason you'd buy an asset purchase. Um, other than there's so much risk, and if there's so much risk, why are you buying it? Well, from a buyer, they, they want to try to recapture a lot of that depreciation and make the balance sheet look nice. So yeah. there are, and so buyers are always saying, hey, I want to do an asset purchase, but they don't want to pay more money. So it comes down <laughs> to that in the end. Yeah. 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 So what in, advice would you provide to, to, to our audience on how to ensure a deal closes quickly? Uh, well, that's a good question. Knowing what you want out of the deal is number one. Uh, sometimes we have potential candidates that come in and they say they know, change their mind or uh, they'll say, oh, I'll look at any business. I'll look at any industry. You don't really care about the dollar right. value. Those end up going nowhere a lot of the time. Right. It's very, it's the ones like PE gate where you guys said, Hey, I'm looking for this industry, this deal size, uh, this type of operation. What do you have on the table that fits those markers? Right. Right. So understanding your own expectations and needs, that's number one. Number two, you know, qualifying again, I'll touch on that word. What are the financial capabilities? What are the skill sets of the people involved? And do those match up with the opportunity? Right. Uh, and one, you know, that a lot of people don't consider until it gets to the point of actually causing an issue or making it easier, having the right advisors involved 
Um, for example, you know, uh, a lawyer may have a deep experience in family law, but have never done an M&A transaction. So the advisor can either learn through the process, which typically makes it a little bit of a longer uh, drawn out type of thing, or you can work with somebody who has done M&A deals before and knows what to work on to move the needle, so to speak, right? There are certain material things that absolutely have to be negotiated and discussed. And there are certain things that you might you know, make a concession, yeah. right? but what is going to move the needle is probably one of the biggest things on making that's sure it. that thing goes forward. That's a good point about family mm -hmm. law. So um, it, going to your accountant, your bookkeeper <laughs> is not necessarily the best idea if you want to exit your business, unless they have any experience. Because we've seen this happen many times. We've negotiated a deal with the seller based on the, their asking price. And it goes to their accountant and and uh, they fill the deal because, oh, that's too little for the business. The accountant had the opinion that the asking price was too, too little. little. Yeah. So. But it was a very fair deal. And, and so and so you got to be careful uh, who you approach uh, as your advisor. It has to be someone who understands transactions. And I think it's true, touching on, on you know, when you, you're saying moving the needle, I remember, not to get into details, but our most recent deal, there was a bit of a, you know, the seller wouldn't accept this, well, we wanted that, and we came up with a financial, you know, a financial engineering of, and that's where I think the benefit is, is between you and Phil, you have over 50 years of experience, and, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing that out of the ordinary, but it's to get creative and ensure that the momentum is there. So moving the needle, I think, is, is key, definitely, with, in terms of what you, you can provide. You can read a lot of books and study a lot on M&A, but there's no question that you learn the most by doing deals. Right. And you might see a situation come up where you say, hey, I would never have thought of that. And it could come from a lawyer who's done a lot of M&A deals. And you think, you know what, I'm going to add that to my negotiation arsenal. And as you move forward, you think, well, these are creative ways to put together a deal that weren't in any book. Right. 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 Interesting. We've okay, so we've got a question here. Uh, Say, can you share an anecdote of a deal that went well versus one that did not? Oh, okay. Um, well, okay. So one of the deals that didn't go well was one of my own. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we worked with a banker who was very sweet, very good intentions. Uh, it was for a hospitality business, which is usually not the favorite uh, type of business that banks like to fund. Okay. But she hadn't done many deals before. Right? And this comes back to having the right advisors and understanding uh, you know, who to work with and what their thought process is and what their experience is. It took two years to get the funding done for this. Oh my. On a very simple, I think it was maybe like 600 grand, uh, on a very simple deal. Um, so that is something that shouldn't happen. I mean, yes, banks do get gummed up a little bit. They might get busier certain times of the year. But for the funding to take two years, uh, that's a little bit of a drawn out process and think about the legal costs that got racked up and all the other ancillary well, effects of that. Yeah. Right? So, so the buyer was waiting for funding and they waited two years. I was the buyer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Two years is a long time. Yeah. So it ended up being me educating her on this is how this works. Here's the documentation you'll need. But one of the values that and I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but one of the values that we bring to people is the network of experienced advisors that we've kind of collected over deals. Right. If we notice that somebody's good at their job, we'll say, Hey, would you mind if we referred business to you down the line? Cause you made this really easy and fun and you know, easy to understand. Um, so this banker was not somebody that we kept in our network, right. but on the other side, if there are certain uh, parameters of a deal, whether it's a share or an asset purchase or a certain dollar threshold that you're looking for, you'll have certain people that are going to do those deals and certain that won't, right? So understanding who to go to, how to make those phone calls, that's one of the things that we bring to the table. Right. Um, deal that went well was one that... You can't uh, say ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one goes without saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the ones that went well was one that uh, we did, one of our brokers did, um, I think going on maybe six months ago now. It was sold to, they did um, concrete work. Okay. And the owner was very much a blue collar guy, hard worker, but didn't really understand the improvements in technology and how to leverage that moving forward. And he'd been running this business for decades um, and he wanted to sell. And typically we'd go out to other blue collar guys who were going to run the business very similarly. But the candidates who purchased it ended up being two very young guys 
zero experience in that so are industry. Are search funds? No, nope, they were individuals. They're actually okay. friends of mine. Oh, okay. Uh, and they told me they were looking for a business. And they had zero experience in manual labor. I mean, these guys had accounting hands. You shake their hands and it's like they're very, yeah. you know. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway. uh, but what they did understand was how to build good company culture, right. how to put together a business that's very highly leveraged on technology. Yeah. So within four months, they exceeded the sales quota of the entire previous year. Yeah. And they're on pace to do, you know, well over seven figures. And uh, they're all very happy. So, and they added in things like employee you know, share profits and uh, you know, all kinds of different bonus structures that didn't exist before. So, those are one of the things that the modern employee is looking for is incentive. Right. right? Like the job market's not secure. So, they can either go out and buy their own business or they can stay and working for you and still make a fair dollar for their time. And that's one thing that we didn't really touch on as far as trends go. Yeah, in that's a great plug right? for us. Thank you. That, <laughs> that, that is what we do, and our platform allows that. So our, our we have a platform. We're, we're an exempt market dealer, and we are regulated by the OSC, and our platform allows selling of shares. So our investors go into an SPV, and after a six-month hold, they can trade their shares. But we're using that, actually, on one of the, the deals we're working on is the, the, the company that wants the employees to participate in ownership. And they see that as a great benefit because our platform can actually allow the trading. What their shares vest, what's the point of having shares in a company if they're not liquid, right? Yeah. So that's what we bring. And, and I we agree. The trend is employee ownership. If you want to retain the talent, uh, you got to share. You just skin in the game, right? A lot of these employees, and there was that one article, I forget the company, where they rewarded employees by giving them shares. I mean, you see this a lot, but... Um, it's not. It's it's actually a sizable amount, and the employees can buy in, and the company actually got sold several years later, and they all reap the benefits of the capital gains on, on that sale. Yeah. You know, when you incentivize people, I mean, they're going to work twice as hard for you, and they're and like you said, they have an inherent interest in the performance of the business. Exactly. Right. So for them to just clock out at five and say, "I'm not doing any more work," well, that kind of hurts them in the end if they're sharing in whatever benefits the company is going to have. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And so I know you touched on this a little earlier. I'm just looking. Some someone was asking about M and A evolution, where yourself and Phil work. What 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 would you say are your core values and and what, get, where you guys focus on? If I'm understanding the question better, your areas of focus as a firm is it is there industry agnostic focus, or? Um, I would think it's more which industries we don't play in. Okay. Uh, we don't do very fast moving tech businesses because that's such a specific business to have to stay on top of. There's so many changing trends, Ooh, so much stuff to, to understand. Uh, so if you're looking at kind of one of these hockey stick type of growth companies where they have burn rates and they're looking to sell within X number of months to you know a, a big public firm for some very specific type of intellectual property, that's not our game. Uh, we sell a lot of retail businesses. We sell a lot of manufacturing and distribution. We sell health and wellness. Basically, anything that's a brick and mortar, uh, we do a lot of those. We have some online businesses as well, but we've always found that there's a lot of unsexy businesses that I mentioned earlier. They're, they do very well. Yeah. They, they can provide an excellent lifestyle for somebody. And you know, going back to what buyers are looking for when they're going you know, to kind of buy a business. What type of lifestyle are you looking for? Do you want to work from home all the time? Or do you want to go into the shop and have people working for you? Uh, all of these things kind of qualify the type of businesses that we bring to the table. But you know, I think it's more what we don't do. And basically, high growth tech businesses is the only thing that we don't look at. Makes <laughs> <laughs> sense. Did you have any questions? Did no, I'm, I'm, I'm checking. Okay. And that is what we focus on as well. Uh, and we, 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 we're not into tech. We like boring, we love boring, right? And traditional businesses. And that's typically the businesses that boomers are selling. And what we like to do is focus on marketing, like low hanging fruit. We see a lot of these boomer businesses have done really well, but the owners are are happy with what they're They're not earns. thinking about social media or, you know, where they rank on Google or marketing or, you know, reaching out to their clients and MailChimp and engaging them. Um, so it's, it's, um, that's, that's really low hanging fruit as our mentioned. Yeah, it is. And like the, the transaction we, we, that recently took place, um, other than communicating the booking and, and confirming things, there's been no communication and we actually 
like you know having that touch point with the with the client uh why not engage with the client and give them content such as this and that's why we do these episodes is it's it's we're not trying to sell ourselves but trying to educate the market and give give back and that's that's the easiest way for us um you know to engage yep yeah we're not selling apps <laughs> we don't, we don't well, us. yeah, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's sexy to say, hey, this is going to be the next Uber or the next Airbnb. And I mean, we use them very often and they are amazing yeah. apps. But, um, you know, someone who manufactures steel isn't going to change the world, but it's very much needed. So. Yeah, well, we're not a venture cap fund. We don't look at, you know, very early startups. We look at businesses that are going concerns. And you yeah. talked about risk earlier. That's one of the mitigations uh, of risk is how successful has this business been over 5, 10, 15 years? And is it a going concern? And when you look at you know, the culture, the operations, everything that's truly solidified within the business, that's one of the things that you know made us gravitate towards this this size and this sector of business right. is that it can help somebody have a good lifestyle. But there's a lot of proven concept within that, right? It's not something that is yet to be proven, yet to be sold. It's hey, you've done over X number of hundred thousands of dollars of profit for ten years. That's a good opportunity for somebody, yeah. right? Yeah. And it might be the Maybe they manufacture window cranks. Like right. you would never think of that, but there's a window in every house. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, we have a question. If you're thinking of selling your business, would you wait until is there a recession coming? Like what? How should you time time, it, time that? I mean, the timing the market, whether it's stock market or general market, is always kind of a, a tough a tough thing to do. Uh, we talked a little bit about what owners can do to prepare. And we touched on, you know, make sure that you have the perspective of corporate profits versus corporate tax mitigation. And we didn't really go into anything further, but extricating themselves from the business as the main driver of value is probably the next biggest thing. Because if the owner retires and the client list goes and all the relationships go and nobody knows where to turn after that, what is the new person coming in for? Right. So that's one of the things that you can do systematize the business as much as possible so that whoever does come in has a very easy reference to this is how you do this this is how you run that here are the key people right and all of those things add what we call premiums to a business valuation right if somebody can come in and turn the key so to speak and make money from day one you're going to see almost regardless of market conditions a pretty fair valuation right and even now with a very high interest rate in the market the delta of let's say pre pre covid commercial loans were five percent six percent you're looking now at eight or nine so that delta of three percent in a you know, pre-recession market it's not really going to make a, a hill of beans a difference when you're looking at several hundred thousand dollars right. of EBITDA or whatever so yeah. to answer the question in short form there isn't really an ideal time it's more how you prepare to exit that business that allows you to get the most value and, out of it and it's true we've seen businesses where the person running the business is amazing. They've got all the contacts and the reason the business does well is because of that person. And we think, okay, well, when we remove this person from the business, what's left? Not, I mean, there, there's assets, there's, there's employees, but the leadership and the momentum was all driven by this one owner. Versus some uh, businesses that we looked at, there have been groomed right-hand people of the owner that once the owner leaves, the, the people that were groomed and were trained over several years, like you said, can just turn the key. They know the systems. They yeah. know that they have the relationships. They know how things run. And the business isn't just going to fall flat once the owner leaves. So that's definitely a big, um, a big uh, um, so, or not a solution, but a key value that we look for in businesses. Buyers are initially motivated by the profitability of the business as far as initial interest goes. But they're truly pushed to close the deal, do all the stuff, due diligence and, you know, negotiate back and forth and take over the keys by their own vision of what they can do with it. Right. And if their vision is here, but the business performance is here and they have to implement every single thing at a granular nature, not only is that time, but that's cost. So that's going to drive their opinion of value down. But if all the things that we just talked about are in place, their vision is pretty clear and they can implement that relatively right. quickly within the first six to 12 months and then start to see even more benefit from that engine. Right. So they're initially interested by the current performance, but they're motivated to actually make the purchase and take over by where their own vision lines up with right. where that is present, present day. And where, where do you see sellers? They, do they want to sell a hundred percent or is there a trend to keep some shares? Cause we've done all for us. Some buyers want a hundred percent. We actually don't mind 
uh, even having minority, and mm-hmm. we don't mind the, the founder keeping shares, especially that we have a platform where they could eventually exit. Mm-hmm. So, but what, what what's a general consensus? It's totally dependent on who's involved, right? Like that deal that I just mentioned, the one that went very well, the incoming young buyers who had zero experience in concrete work, they offered that the old owner maintain some shares and they made the, him the lead estimator for that business because right. they said, hey, we can never time compress 30 so years of knowledge of into three months, right? But we might see somebody who is already in the industry and they think, well, we already know this game. We want to buy 100% of this company and make it even better than it already is. So right. there isn't really a specific trend. It's more about who the candidates are and what they bring to the table from an experience perspective and how they want to run the business, right? So how hard, so the founder ended up keeping some shares? Yeah, he ended up keeping shares and they're, that's part of why it's growing so quickly is that he can actually go out and still be a part of it. And there's that factor of cultural safety within the staff that there's a familiar face here, even though there's a right. new head honcho, so to speak, we know this guy is still in place and it creates an area of, of Comfort, I guess, yeah. if you will, right? The straw that stirs the drink. I, I will say we've, we've offered a similar structure. There's some owners that they say, you know, I just want to sell a business and ski in the Alps for the rest of my life. And they want, we're like, we're saying maybe do you want to keep five, 10% shares, stay on the board very high level because they have the network. And he said, no, he wants to leave. So that was a bit of, no, I wouldn't say red flag, but was a bit of a, a problem area for us versus some businesses where, um, it's their baby. They want to still stay involved. It's hard for them to do nothing. And, um, and, and they, they keep some shares as well for, it's an investment at the end of the day. You made a good point there. And there was a previous question, you know, what should an owner do when they're considering to sell based on timing, whatever, I think regardless of the timing, ask yourself what you're going to do after. Right? a lot of these people have done only the business for however many years. Yeah. And that's where the majority of their time is spent and the rest is with family and you know personal time. But once you sell your business, if you don't have something to do after, you will find yourself depressed or you will find yourself bored and then think, well, what have I done? Have I made a mistake? Yeah. Right. So always ask yourself, and we ask this to clients, what are you going to do after? Yeah. Right. And if they don't have that plan, we help them explore different options, whether it's buying another business that's less time consuming or, you know, focusing on personal matters. But there always has to be something post business. Otherwise, it, it does end up weighing on the, the individual for some right. time before they figure that out. Yeah, it's true. So we have we have a cement deal that went on pause and maybe coming back and the owners were adamant that they want to sell a hundred percent but then after uh, meeting them they they were willing to keep 20 which really brings our risk level down right? and they were, they were excited because they said that they they worked so hard to build up a great business they said well if it is a great business and new partners come in to try and take it to the next level why would we not want a piece of that investment um and of course they have a lot of the knowledge so they they, they were considering of keeping five to ten percent um so so we're, we're excited hopefully those uh, those discussions come back up uh, we do have another question oh sorry no, no, no. oh yeah um do do you do uh, real estate brokerage deals yeah we are all licensed realtors uh, we're actually governed by rico that's one of the governing bodies you can either have a securities license or you can be governed by the real estate council yeah so all of our brokers are licensed real estate agents it's it's a mandatory requirement when yeah. you join m a evolution and many of these deals that we're doing often have real estate so that's room. that's it's, it's funny we see deals with real estate what's your without swaying it either way what's your opinion about deals with real estate when it comes to transacting small businesses well, it's usually a bigger dollar value, first of all, so we don't mind that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but secondly, it allows some benefits from a financial perspective, right? You can leverage the value of the real estate in a number of different ways. And sometimes it can be used as a negotiation um, piece where perhaps there's a first right of refusal down the road in a couple of years for the buyer to purchase and the seller makes residual income as the landlord moving forward. Yeah. Right? So it adds a layer of complexity that's actually a benefit when you look at, well, if you're going to take this price for the business, maybe making X amount per month as a landlord for a few years will kind of wet your whistle a bit to move forward on that. Uh, so we like them. I mean, yeah. And banks love real estate. I mean, they're always going to invest in real estate. So it, it does present an additional factor for them to say, hey, well, you know, this is a piece of fairly stable asset that we can put our money yeah. into. And we will give you probably a higher percentage uh, loan to value than a business. Yeah, where we're seeing an issue is when the real estate value is triple the value or double the value of the business. Yeah. And you're always thinking, is that the best use of that property? 
and uh, so so that and that that's generally around Toronto though, in the GTA. Yeah, not outside. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there's always positives and negatives to yeah. everything in M&A, and right? and sometimes we're finding uh, the owner had purchased the real estate twenty years ago, and we look at the numbers, uncover the hood of, of the financials, and the reason the business is doing so well is because they own the building and the market, the rates are not, are not up to market. And once you start to implement a market, let's say you purchase just the business and then you start paying rent, well, there's not much money left. So, so it's, it's things, you know, you kind of need to lift the hood to see what the real estate, what the rent values are. Uh, and that's happened to us a few times. Well, at the first stage of valuation, those are one of the normalizations that we put right. in, right? We do a fair market assessment of value and what either a rental factor or a mortgage factor would be on this business, right. on this building, so that we can actually look at the business's true profit by the end of that. Assuming and, you're a tenant and not the owner. Or either way, right? Because you can pretty easily come to figure out what a mortgage rate is going to be or what a rent factor is going to be. Mm -hmm. So if the owner is supposed to pay 50 grand a month, but they're only paying 10, of course, that's going to inflate the bottom line. Right. But we don't want to allow that to go out onto the market as falsely advertised, very profitable. When dig down into it, it's you know forty grand delta. We're like, okay, this is not something that any buyer is going to look into. And then we waste our time, we waste the client's time by not going through that procedure. Yeah. So again, qualifying. That's one of the aspects that we look at. And well, the word of the day, yeah, qualifying. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, that's it for questions. Uh, thank you again for being here with us. Uh, we, like you said, relationship, it's, it's very key. So um, we're, we're glad to have started this relationship with Bill and yourself and M&A Evolution. And uh, we might have another deal in the pet service industry. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah. We're very excited. And if, yeah, we are looking to invest more in the pet service sector. Um, so uh, keep those deals coming. And Looking forward to our next. And session. if you are interested in chatting with uh, Phil or Andrew at M&A Evolution, uh, please reach out to us, or you can find them find them online. And uh, this recording will be made available online, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Thank you so much, and I love what you guys are doing at PE Gate. It's it's refreshing to work with clients like you who are kind of uh, amenable to both sides, enjoyable to work with, and we've shared many laughs over the phone. So. Typically in this business, you'll see a lot of repeat clients and we look forward to doing more deals with you guys and maybe even another webcast. Who knows? Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thanks guys. Okay. Bye. Bye.